So if you were Italy right now, or Spain, and suffering thousands of deaths from the coronavirus, and the EU, that body that was there to unify Europe, was quibbling about how it should fund that support, wouldn't you be wondering whether EU membership was worth it? In fact, when this is over, and you are possibly riddled with more debt as a consequence from all of this, wouldn't you be thinking, what is the point of staying in the EU? And could Italy and Spain and others quickly follow the UK on the back of the way the EU has dealt with the coronavirus. That's today on the Debunking Economics podcast. Yes, I'm Phil Dobby, and Steve Keen is with me again, of course. The EU is meeting this week to discuss corona bonds, which is something Steve talked about weeks ago on this pod, uh, podcast, funding uh, what could be generated through bonds which are bought by the European Central Bank and issued in large volumes to help countries suffering the most uh, to, to, that need the resources, basically, to, to manage their way through this crisis. But some in the ECB like Germany and the Netherlands, still see the funding coming through loans, just so those southern European countries don't get used to the idea of lots of free money. So they come out of this crisis with more austerity as they try and pay back those loans, just to add to the general sense of misery. Oh, Steve, the joys of the EU. Well, it is a joy for those who uh, who, who live in the north of the EU anyway, because they don't have to go through all this austerity. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's incredible how the ideology can be sustained uh, when reality is slapping it in the face and kicking it in the balls. Mm. But that's what's going on, particularly this, this, this just particularly Germanic uh, dedication to what's known as auto-liberalism, which is a combination of the sort of extreme uh, libertarian attitude that you'll find a lot of among a lot of uh, American libertarian Austrian types combined with this Germanic idea where you've got to enforce it. So that's where the auto comes from. And they're hanging and say, we've got to get right back to austerity as soon as we finish this without thinking, well, if we didn't have austerity, maybe we'd have enough beds right now in the hospitals and enough intensive care units to be able to cope, yeah, which we but don't. Germany is covered, of course. I mean, they've got, I mean, it's very sad, but they've got uh, almost 2,000 deaths there in Germany. But compare that to Italy, where it's uh, over 17,000, almost 18,000 deaths. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they're in a much better position. Uh, yeah, they've, they've got the capacity to some extent, but, but um, and, and you know, they're having a decent public health system helps. They haven't destroyed that, whereas the Americans didn't have one to begin with. And yeah. Destroy what they've got and, and, they've so, got, and they've got a government surplus, so if they need to spend more money, they can dip into it. They don't. That has no, no relevance whatsoever, but yes, I'll let you get away with that well, one. Well, no, I mean, from, from their point of view, I'm putting them in, in, in their point of view. Their that, point of view they'll be saying, yeah, we've got, we've got the government money, we can spend it. Yeah, that's true. They'll, that's, that's the reasoning that they'll use, unfortunately. And Italy doesn't have that surplus. So people in the South aren't going to buy this. So when, when this is all done and dusted, once this is all over... People in Greece and in Italy and in Spain and Portugal, they're all going to say, hang on a second, uh, the EU didn't work for us in, in, in this occasion. We didn't get, uh, there, was, there was no funding coming. We didn't get any, any extra funding. You didn't help out. What, what are we getting for our membership? Particularly Italy, yeah, and, and in Spain too. I mean, that's, the situation with them is absolutely appalling. So, um, I, and if they, it's, when, they, when, they, when the Italians can rely upon the Cubans uh, and the Chinese more than they can upon their own neighbours, the whole idea of European solidarity ain't looking so crash hot. It's not solidarity. It's, it's, it's being locked into a death cult. And, and the euro is the big problem here, isn't it? Because we've got one central bank. The, the one central bank issues the bonds. They determine how those bonds are, uh, if they are going to embark on quantitative easing. I mean, they could, if they wanted to, uh, if they if they change the regulations of the EU, which they have loosened now, there's nothing to stop the uh, Europeans agreeing that the the central bank will issue a mass of new debt, new bonds, and that will go to funding the crisis in Italy. There's nothing at all to stop that happening. No, but as you say, it's just ideology. Yeah, and it's also it's been set up in such a way that it can't make a decision unless it's a decision to improve austerity. Or increase austerity because again, uh, we, we, I remember when I when I was you know you remember I voted for uh, Britain leaving the EU uh, at the time mm. I made the, the arguments in favour of it not from the point of view of what would benefit Britain because I thought the EU was an organisation that shouldn't it shouldn't exist given its policies. Uh, somebody said, look, 
you can't say it's not democratic. Look at this democratic structure here. Well, the democratic structure I sent was, first of all, the European Commission, a bunch of economic-dominated bureaucrats, they draft the laws, not the parliament. The parliament cannot independently draft the laws. Then uh, the law is sent to the parliament for ratification or objection, uh, and as well as the, if the parliament votes against the law or uh, then it can also be voted for by the 19 finance ministers who meet independently and who have no records are kept at their meetings. And that's why Yanis Varoufakis' recent move to release all the recordings he made I think is a brilliant move because it shows us how stupidly and badly they behave. So the whole thing is set up in such a way that whatever the Commission wants to happen will happen. Whatever it is wants to happen, you can get... You can get well, I was going to use a word starting with F. Um, but it, it is... Stuffed. Let's go for stuffed. Stuffed. You're going to get stuffed. <laughs> so, consequently, there is there is no um, capacity to make a decision unless it's a decision which supports the direction of the Maastricht Treaty and makes it yeah. even more difficult to spend, to create government money and even more difficult to rescue people in, in the dire circumstances of the coronavirus. So this could be the death knell. I certainly... I would like what I'd like to see happen is Italy simply say we've had enough. Uh, every bank account in Italy is now a, now a lira account. Uh, the new lira is worth one euro. Uh, we repudiate all our international debts, including those of German and French banks. You guys can get stuffed. Um, and we're starting our own monetary system again. Do you think that'll happen? I mean, Greece came so close to it, didn't they? I mean, Giannis was uh, was on the verge of uh, of pushing that button if he if he could, could, would have got support within his within his own government. Do you think uh, Italy will? And if Italy does, then obviously uh, Greece and Spain aren't going to be far behind. It's possible. I mean, Italy's got a appalling trajectory in terms of the number of deaths right now. So. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it quite possibly, and you know, with, the, with the leader of being, being a populist, right-wing populist as well, it's a possibility. And um, certainly, uh, it, 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 we actually discussed in a previous podcast what would shift after this, uh, you know, would people say we overreacted and so on. I think Italy is one country where people are going to say, right, this went really badly, really, really badly, and we've got to do something about it, and we're not taking uh, Belgian bullshit anymore. Uh, on this week, we, you know, if we, if we just think that Belgium doesn't like anymore, Belgium being the centre of the EU, uh, then we're going to do it. And so I, I think there's a possibility that the fracture could come through Italy uh, over the corona crisis. So it's interesting when you look back at the foundation of the EU. I mean, it really came out of a crisis, didn't it? The, the crisis being the, the, the Second World War. Then we had the Marshall Plan. And it was America pumping large amounts of money into Germany to industrialise Germany and the concerns from the French uh, that uh, Germany was going to become too dominant, which is why, the, you know, early on, France wanted to share a currency to try and uh, avoid the, the, the imbalance. And, of course, Germany had uh, all that debt basically to, to, to the US written off. How quickly they forget. And they also, they not, not, let's not forget German debt to, to Greece, for God's sake, um, you know, mm. which the Greeks wrote off. So it, it is r- remarkable how fast we fail to learn from history. And um, this, this will be something on the, on the level of the Second World War, by the way. Um, the impact is so great, uh, so rapid. Uh, whether it could be avoided or not, whether we could have reacted in a different fashion or not, that doesn't change it. It will be the biggest economic crisis since since the Great Depression and the fastest shutdown of productive resources since the Second World War. So at the same time, I mean, we had all this fear, didn't we, during the uh, the Brexit campaign that the EU was going to uh, allow Turkey into the EU. We did allow Hungary into uh, the EU, and Janus Ada, their basically, leader now, is basically a dictator. He's uh, got full powers. Uh, he's enacted. No sunset clause on, on when, when that power might end. He's still a member of the EU. So basically, uh, dictators are allowed in the EU now. Yeah, well, they always were. <laughs> the, the whole idea that the democratic institution is a joke, and mm. uh, the joke is being exposed right now. Uh, because you know, what would people want on the ground? They want, you know, for example, they want masks. No, you can't have them. They want, uh, you know, ICU units. No, you can't have them. Oh, this is democratic, yeah. isn't it? So it goes one way or the other, doesn't it? It either falls apart or it becomes, uh, which is perhaps more dangerous. It it, it becomes. Uh, pulled together more but if it put and we've spoken about this before if the eu acts as one nation uh then one nation w- would not allow 
the southern part of the country to have such a massive death rate. That would be people like people in London uh, laughing in cocktail bars while, while people in the north of, of England died of starvation. I mean, you can't allow that to happen. So Europe isn't behaving like one country. It, it, it wants to be more integrated, but it's still going to be a, a, a series of sovereign nations. And it is each of those nations is still going to be in it for what they can, what, what they can get out of it. Yeah, that's the trouble. I mean, there, there's a certain sense of European uh, commonality, not quite that that dire, but nonetheless, the, the Europeans identify as, as, you know, Swiss and Germans and Dutch, et cetera, et cetera, first and Europeans second. Americans identify as Americans first and Alabamans and Californians and so on second. So it, it, this is the thing even Milton Friedman realised was when he, we, he wrote in, in opposition to the formation of the euro in the very first instance that you don't have the degree of commonality. You know, also in a very important point, which have even, again, even Milton Friedman realised this, you don't have a common treasury. Without a common treasury, the expenses get passed from one effectively state uh, treasury to another, which is, which are spending constrained, um, and they resent therefore people moving one from one state to another because you impose the burden of the welfare needs of that person on the on the recipient state. So all these things just argue against the EU and the euro from the very first outset. And the whole thing about it was supposed to strengthen Europe. Well, great, what fabulous strengthening this has been. Uh, first of all, it amplified the impact of the crisis back in 2008. Now it's having a debilitating impact upon its capacity to respond to the coronavirus. They'd be better off by separating. And this is the great yeah. tragedy of the European Union. Well, so will it then? So if if, uh, if Italy says that's it, as you say, we're, going, we're not going to pay off our debts uh, so you can get... Uh, Stuffed, mm. uh, and uh, the uh, so they pull out of the euro, even if they don't pull out of the EU, but probably out of all of it. But even if they just pulled out of the euro, uh, and they went back to uh, uh, to the to their own currency, went back to the lira, the uh, uh, that would pretty quickly devalue. Uh, they would have a competitive edge against Germany. They could uh, build a uh, a manufacturing base to to challenge Germany o- over time, um, and. Uh, uh, a healthier future, I'd suggest for for Italy. Yeah, and that's what I've been arguing that for a long time. Because so why wouldn't um, they do it? And why wouldn't everyone it, else it, follow them? I can still see people sticking on saying now we've got to maintain the euro. And there's, you know, I, I wish people would learn from these sort of experiences. But again, as I said a lot in the last podcast, I've experiences that made me rather uh, pessimistic about the capacity of people to learn from experience. However, uh, if the if the Italians did pull out and did go back to the lira and could devalue against the euro, then they would lose the one of the two main problems they've had from the euro to begin with, which is with a lower inflation rate than Germany, uh, necessarily their goods got more expensive over time because they were not able to devalue. Once they can devalue, the difference in inflation rates doesn't matter. And therefore, the mm. competitiveness that Lamborghini and Ferrari and Fiat have lost against Mercedes, Benz and BMW would disappear and they could re-strengthen their manufacturing sector. So it, it would be... A, an amazing lesson in how, how bad an idea it was to form the euro in the first place to get out of the damn thing and see the economy do quite well. And by the way, if you, they did actually write off all their debts, then it's quite possible they could revalue against the euro and still do well because they wouldn't be carrying any debts, whereas the rest of the European Union would. And they can do that, can they? Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's no but- – uh, plenty of countries have, have written off their foreign debts in the past. And mm. as soon as they do it, the people say, well, your currency is going to plunge in value because the market won't trust you. 30 seconds later, the bond traders have absorbed the whole experience and they're now buying your, your currency because you're no longer a debt encumbered. So uh, what does it do to the banking sector in, the, in, in that process, though? Well, again, you've got, to, you've got to be ready at the central bank, which you need. There is actually an Italian central bank. Every, every European country has its own central bank. It just doesn't have a power to issue a currency. Uh, we say, well, you suddenly you've got the power and you can therefore provide as much uh, in a way of, of, of assets to the banking sector so that the liabilities don't exceed the assets and therefore they don't go bankrupt. Uh, you can do that instantly. Uh, then they would, they would enable the banking sector to continue operating. So, so say Italy and you know, others then say, well, you know, we're going to follow in the, in the, in the, in the same path. If that threat is made to the, uh, to the EU, 
I mean, are they going to look for, for a halfway house? We talked about, you know, maybe the idea that perhaps there could be everyone can have their own independent currencies, their own independent bank, and we just have a, a common trading currency like we used to with the uh, with the EQ. So, I mean, that that is stripping back the EU, isn't it? So it becomes dem- almost more like the common market. Yeah. You, when you get, to, you get to that stage, then Britain might say, well, actually, you know what? Uh, we didn't want to be in the EU, but we might be part of this. Yeah. The common how, would help, how would it help Britain's case? The common market was a relatively sensible idea. It gave you a chance to have economies of scale across the whole uh, continent, which was the objective of the European Union in the first instance. The mistake was forming the euro as well. Um, So, yes, it could could be quite effective. And to me, my argument has always been use the euro for international trade, uh, in, in trade between countries of the European Union, uh, use your own currencies domestically. And the, the real appeal to the public of the euro, and I've experienced this, of course, with the amount of travelling I've done in the European Union, is you, you follow exactly the same currency wherever you are in the country. You face no currency loss when you go from Germany to France to Italy to Spain and so on. And that's personally, that's a very attractive advantage of the euro. My argument has been let the European Central Bank take over the currency conversion responsibilities. So you shut down all the private institutions. You tell them you don't shut them down. You give them impossible competition. The a government uh, bureaucracy converts the currency at an exactly exactly the exchange rate. If you have a thousand lira and that's worth mm. two thousand francs, you walk in with a thousand lira. You walk out with two thousand francs. You suffer zero currency loss going from one country to another. That would be a central role for the European Central Bank. And then with that, right, there's no need to have uh, the same currency across the whole of the continent. You just, as, as a community, you ensure that no individual loses out of the ridiculous markups that these companies make for exchanging currency. Yeah, but do you know what? I wonder whether, in fact, that, that becomes less of an issue going forward as we have more technology and more competition for you know, that, that side of the banking sector for, for foreign exchange, which we're seeing quite a lot of. Well, I, you know, so uh, there are. Yeah. So, I, you know, so you have a you have a card. You don't you don't really care. You go from you go from Germany into Italy. You go, you, you switch currencies. Uh, you, you've got a vague awareness of of what the the exchange rate may be, and you've you've signed up to a a, a, a bank or a card mm. which is going to give you the best possible exchange rate. Does it really matter? Well, that, that's what I, I'm a heavy user of Transferwise, for example, and I'll a couple of yeah. un, un, unsponsored advertisement out here. It's a fabulous system, Transferwise, <laughs> and it saved yeah. me a large amount other of money. Ones are ava- other ones are available. Well, World yeah, first yeah. and the transfer uh, was with the FX. Yeah. yeah. It, it's yeah. brilliant. They totally undercut the incredible markups that are made in all those foreign to currency exchanges. I don't really worry about the cost of going from one currency to another anymore. Uh, I use the same card everywhere. It's a great so idea. For them, just, just, so the idea of the euro being one unified currency to make it easy as you move around and as you trade, I'm just wondering whether that you know that that, that selling proposition is is rapidly disappearing. So you know, one of the key reasons for the euro perhaps is it, it is not such a key reason anymore. Which it was, it was a key reason back in 2000, obviously, or 1999, obviously. But, but yeah, you're right now that that's not technology and the fact that there's an enormous financial uh, incentive there for people to move into that particular space. That's a classic case of capitalism innovating to take advantage of a, of a, of a large discontinuity in the economy. So if that was to happen then, if the euro did disappear, could the EU survive without it? And, uh, and what form would that take, do you think? Well, to go back to being a common market. That's all it would need to be, a common market, and you have a forum for coming over discussing to uh, resolve uh, disputes between states. And it should be one where the, where the states have, uh, you know, you, you have representative of the Italian, the French, the German, et cetera, governments coming together just to have conversations, not, not having the idea of a bloody parliament, which itself is a farce. The parliament, as I said before, and only decides to do what the European Commission tells it to do. And there's nothing like a democracy. It's been a, a, the whole idea of the European Union from the ordinary Europeans' point of view, was to end the old, you know, internecine warfares of the European uh, c- continent. But from the point of view of the bureaucrats, it was to get the people out of the way and let the bureaucrats run everything because obviously it was democracy that gave us fascism. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> it also gave us Donald Trump. Uh, so, you know... It- yeah, yeah, I'm not saying democracy is perfect by any stretch of it. And that I, I, want to get, I want to get rid of it and replace it with a set of skilled uh, individuals who don't want to do the job, who are system dynamic specialists and united by intelligent software that's what we really need to run the complex system of the world we're in these days rather than, you know, the popularity contest of standard democracy. Right. 
Okay, and uh, are, are you going to be are you going to be the head of that government as well? Have you? Are you, are you saying, oh, please, please, <laughs> please. Setting your, uh, which, <laughs> you do need to be too old to have to answer the question. Uh, keen, uh, my arms in the air mm. as I talk to you. But yeah, I, I take your, <laughs> I'm I, tickling your underarms. <laughs> I'm loving it. So uh, I take your point though that you know we so we certainly need more skilled uh, people in, in in parliament, and there's none of that let's, happening. Let's yet. let's make, let's have a podcast on a particular issue: democracy versus versus uh, systemic governance. That's, right. that's an important point to discuss at a later point. <laughs> Gee. All right. So back to the EU, though. I mean, we, what we're describing then really is that uh, it's a common market. There has to be agreement on standards. Uh, that, that there's no need to discuss uh, subsidies or, or, or well, well, maybe you still do so. Do, you, do, do governments then say, well, okay, we're going to have this common, common market. We need to make sure you're not subsidizing your products and, and dumping products on our market uh, uh, because you've given so much state subsidies. I guess you still need regulations like that, don't you? So, so that you've got a level playing field. Yeah, there's some sort of commonality. That's it's a common market it has to have common regulations. That's okay. Mm. It's the it's the imposition of uh, the you know, budgetary uh, noose of the uh, Maastricht Treaty and the inability of any decision to be reached that isn't something the European Commission wants. Uh, it's having bureaucrats who are all trained, mainly trained economists, and that's the bloody problem. Yeah, that's the danger, uh, isn't it? So trained, but, engineers, trained engineers would be much damp, a damn sight better. Right, but a lot of it is just finding commonality of, of com- level playing field for competition, isn't it? So it's setting, setting standards. So you do, you, I mean, you, you're not going to do that by Parliament. Someone's got to se- establish what those standards are going to be. Equally, so. equally at the same point, there's also one thing I hope we learn out of this crisis, that the whole idea of a globalised economy, integrated economy, is a mistake at a biological level. You need mm. to have regionalised economies. I'm, I've, I've, I've been arguing for a long time we need a biological approach to economics in general, and that would never have had us uh, having globalised production systems because globalised production systems are great for pathogens. Yeah. They're not fabulous for humans. So this, this, if we, I hope we learn that lesson and we don't go back to the obsession about bigger and bigger trading blocks and more and more free trade and more and more transportation around the planet, et cetera, et cetera, more and more consumption of oil. Right. But, for that, but that is a good reason for making sure that the trade within the EU continues then, isn't it? So that we're not buying, for example, the UK is not shipping a whole lot of stuff across the, the ocean from the US or from South America yeah. or, or from China. We yeah. are better off eating fruit, for example that comes from uh, the, the south of Europe rather than... Exactly. Yeah, and you, 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 make a, you try to you define a regional trading block. And my, my actual principle here is what's called the von Neumann machine. Have you heard, ever heard of that one? I think I had one, but I couldn't uh, work the instructions. No, 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 sorry, mate, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> a von Neumann machine is a machine that can make other machines and also make itself. Right. All oh, right. Okay. Okay. No. okay. So, 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 the, the, one of the most brilliant men of all time, uh, von Neumann, uh, uh, came up with the concept of, uh, the, they said, humanity needs to create a machine which is capable of making all the other machines needed as well as reproducing itself. And then you'd send that into outer space and you could colonise the entire galaxy. But the idea we should think in terms of creating regions of the planet which are von Neumann machines, meaning they create everything they need as well as being able to reproduce themselves over time. And when you, you say, okay, what, what's, what, what scale do we need so this region is self-contained and then have multiple self-contained regions like that which don't need to trade with others? Uh, you don't go for this obsession with a globalised doing over a planetary basis because that works in favour of the pathogens, that works in favour of humans putting a, overloading the planet, completely ignoring the other species, and then we get this sort of you know, biological venereal disease coming back at us. But, I mean, all the more reason for the EU to, in some form, even if it is just a common market working to mm-hmm. common standards, yeah. uh, but everybody has their own central bank, they determine the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the way they operate, how much they borrow, how much their, their debt, jet, debt to GDP ratio is. They are uh, uh, totally independent sovereign nations but they have a, a common agreement on uh, what they're going to sell and the standards between them uh, that's got to be the utopia hasn't it that we'd be wanting because it, it does create that trading block that the eu could then say well look, we really don't need anyone else well that's the, the trouble to reach that utopia you've had to go through a dystopia to experience why it's necessary but yes uh, treating it as a, as a regional production system uh intending to re- achieve overall self-sufficiency across all the products that are necessary to sustain a decent high, uh, human society and a decent environment 
not just for ourselves, but for the other species on the planet. That's the that's the way we should be thinking in the future. Do you think that's going to happen though? Will the EU survive, and will it will it just survive the way it is? I mean, could for example Italy say, "Well, we want out of the euro, but we'll stay in the EU," to which the the payoff would be, "Well, okay, you can't write off all your debt. You're going to have to pay it up back, back after uh, off over t- over twenty years. You're going to have to live in austerity, and uh, mm. uh, and perhaps more people, even more people, will die uh, from uh, malnutrition." And died from the from the virus as you attempt to pay all this back. I, I mean that that seems more likely than Italy pulling out totally and the EU collapsing, doesn't it? Sadly, uh, yeah. I mean the, the thing is that also let's remember that there have been other you know, pan pan you know, European pan global organization which have disappeared for example what's the most recent announcement of the league of nations yeah they have been very quiet <laughs> lately it's haven't they died about 80 years ago i think that's why uh, it was killed by the first world war so the, the organization yeah. that the, the, these organizations have failed in the past and i can think of no better organization to fail than the european union but it's so but we, but we don't but we don't no. want it to disappear and then just have a, uh, a a series of independent nations do we i mean well, it, the, 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 it's where the honest i mean Yanis Varoufakis has uh, finally come around to saying he reckoned the British did the right thing for the wrong reasons and leaving the European Union. And it, it may be that, that you know, you, it, it's very hard to expect somebody to, to, to whose who's entire life has been around trying to globalise everything and trying to minimise trade barriers, et cetera, et cetera, and, and go for, uh, you know, uh, letting competition rip and, 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 and ignoring uh, sustainability while pushing efficiency. It's very hard to have that person suddenly flip over to a biological way of thinking. You've simply got the wrong people in there and getting rid of them is, is, is impossible uh, in, a, in a bureaucracy. So it may be that it has to fail to be replaced by something more sensible. Right. I wonder what would uh, replace it. Could we, in fact, get a, a group of countries like for perhaps France, maybe we'll include Germany, the, the UK and Ireland uh, uh, and Spain and Greece saying, well, OK, let's it, that's all falling apart. But we need to trade with each other because we've got so much trade across our, our across our borders. So let's at least agree some standards and let's form the new the new EU. That, that could be what happens, I think. It's uh, and, and, and the emphasis has to be on the ecological and social sustainability of the society, not this obsession with competition and efficiency. So it, it, it could happen. But I certainly can't see the bureaucrats in Brussels being the ones who lead the charge. And how quickly is it going to fall apart then, do you reckon? Is, it, is, is that going to be after this, after we're over this fire, second half of this year? Is this going to be the big story? Um, no. I, again, because of my, my cynicism about people's capacity to learn from experience, I think we'll go through this. will be an aftermath. There'll be a, oh, let's see, we, we can continue on. And then something else will hit us. I mean, with 2020 has been a one, one dog of a year. I mean, we had the, you know, the fires in Sydney, the uh, and the floods, flood fires in Australia, then the floods in Australia, then the locust plagues in Africa, which we've stopped talking about, but are probably still happening. Now the coronavirus. Uh, we're still, we're only, we're only one third of the way into the year. What the hell's going to come along next? Well, we've got a lot more of this to go, haven't we? I think this is going to keep us going for the rest of the year. But I mean, just your idea that this will be almost swept under the carpet and it's going to take something else to to split up the EU. I wonder if that's the case because look, over seventeen thousand uh, deaths now in in Italy, less than two thousand in Germany. Uh, 14,000 in Spain. There's, there's just a, a huge difference, a huge disparity uh, between nations. And mm. surely people are going to be looking at that and saying, how did we allow, allow this to happen? We, I mean, we're talking about the price on human life. Uh, and Surely there's going to be some uh, recompense from all of this. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, just looking at the, the doubling rate, by the way, for Germany is not looking as healthy as the doubling rate for um, Spain right now, strangely enough. So maybe maybe there'll be um, pr- prices to pay in the future. Still, the next week could we be see very that's, and that's the bad news because if Germany gets hit as, as as much as everybody else, then that argument that, uh, that, that uh, there's a disparity on this disappears, and so uh, the you know to which the conclusion will be in Germany and from the the, the, the powers behind the EU that uh, well that was a that was a crisis that we all faced. It, uh, we we all paid the price for it. Now let's carry on as normal. Yeah, yeah, it's. Um this, this was a crisis nobody expected except anybody who'd read uh, Laurie Garrett's The Coming Plague. And these are people who've been completely sidelined in the redesign of society. These are the epidemiologists, uh, the, the, the specialists in humans as a biological species, not humans as the dominant economic force on the planet. They're the ones who saw this coming. 
they've been sidelined. The one thing I hope to happen out of all this is that we suddenly stop pay, pay much less attention to bloody economists and a damn sight more to epidemiologists, engineers, physicists and atmospheric scientists. They're the people we need to listen to, not bloody economists. And the EU was built by economists. That's one of the best reasons to get rid of it. We should leave it there. But one final question is, I mean, a lot of it does relate to the acceptance of debt, doesn't it? That's the core of all of this. So uh, German debt to GDP, you know, what is it, 60 or 70 percent government debt versus, you know, 200 percent in Japan. The US is shooting up there as well. Uh, Greece, I think, is, you know, is less than than 200 percent. Italy is, you know, relatively low. I mean, if you if they just said, well, OK, well, let's accept 200 percent acceptable or 150 percent acceptable, then you would have allowed a massive increase in spending. Yeah. And this is the thing. The, the, the government debt is, is, is not the problem. It's because the government. This is the, we've had many talks on this issue in terms of uh, the financial issues as well. Uh, but the whole obsession with government debt has always been wrong. It's always come out of neoclassical economics and uh, applying a household analogy to an overall economy. It's the private debt that matters. That's what's caused all the dilemmas. That's what has led to the boom beforehand and the bust as well. Uh, Hopefully, some of that uh, understanding will get through during this crisis as well. Right. So if the EU survived, but they accepted that point, could it could it survive and do good rather than uh, be evil if it, if it accepted the fact that we should allow countries to run much heavier debt? Um, potentially. But again, the, that, that, that means countries which have divergent inflation rates can't. The, 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 euro, the euro should not survive. That's the one thing. The euro mm. should not survive. The European Union potentially could survive. Uh, should survive if it if it learns from this crisis and fundamentally changes its direction. But that's like expecting a Ptolemaic astronomer to suddenly understand Copernicus and stop drawing epicycles and start to thinking about ellipses uh, centered on the sun. It is it is it, the people's minds are, are reshaped by the belief systems they have, and that reshaping means they're simply incapable of the neurons are wired the wrong way. It, it, it is it is not possible for someone to to change their neural wiring as fast as it is for a new person to come along with a you know a fairly open neural network and, and relearn these issues. So in many ways, we've just got to retire the people who currently run the European Union. If we could keep the buildings and to send the people off to retirement homes, we might get somewhere. Generational change is what you're talking about, isn't it? And uh, mm-hmm. they're all looking pretty old. Time to shuffle on uh, and do your next thing. Uh, good to talk, Steve. Catch you again very soon. Okay, mate. Bye. And talking about neoclassic economics, uh, we are going to look at Adam Smith next time. Is there anything good that came out of Adam Smith's work? Anything that we can take and say, oh, that was all right. Uh, We'll look at that next time on the Debunking Economics podcast with Professor Steve Keen. I'm Phil Dobby. See you then. 